So this video is based on external growth. And just a reminder that external growth is when you grow by the assistance uh, of another firm. So it could be uh, two firms merging together to create one firm. It could be a firm uh, acquiring another firm. But in all these examples, it's with the assistance of another firm. And that's why it's external. Now, within this particular video, we're going to be looking at horizontal growth. And when we're looking at horizontal integration, we're looking at two firms in the same industry at the same stage within the supply chain and they are either merging or acquiring um, but the similarities between the firms are obviously pretty relevant so when we're looking at uh, an example it could be a retailer within the supermarket industry so two retailers merging together within the same supermarket industry that would be horizontal the example that we're going to be looking at is a very very famous one and it's with uh, Kraft and it's with Heinz. So just to highlight the context, I'm just going to show you a quick news broadcast uh, based on the merger. Kraft Dinner and Ketchup have long been merged in Canadian bowls, but the pairing got a lot more official on Wednesday when the two brands agreed to a tie-up. Now, a quick overview of what's involved here. Heinz is the maker of ketchup, as well as other sauces, snacks like bagel bites, and some infant products. It's owned by the Oracle of Omaha Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway, as well as 3G Capital. This Brazilian private equity group has been hungry for food deals. They were also behind the merger of Burger King and Tim Hortons last year. You know Kraft, of course, for the noodles and the slices, but there are many other brands that are also under this umbrella, such as Jell-O, Kool-Aid, Cool Whip, Crystal Light, Tassimo, Maxwell House, and Philadelphia Cream Cheese. According to Kraft, 98% of Canadians and Americans buy its products. Now, Kraft is pretty much a North American company, but it has aspirations to change that. And that's actually the same goal Tim Hortons has, and it was one of the reasons the restaurant chain gave for its merger with Burger King, which has more than half of its stores outside the U.S. Heinz is much the same, with a strong international business. Along with finding new markets, Kraft says its products haven't evolved fast enough with consumer demands for healthy food, and commodity prices have also put pressure on its results. So, Kraft has shaken up management to change... I wanted to make it simple here for everyone to understand. We're going to bring up the ingredients in this deal. You've got Heinz, which was taken private by 3G and Berkshire in 2013. And then you've got Kraft, the slower growing, less exciting North America snack focused business that was split off from the more exciting Mondelez. Plus, you've got $10 billion in capital from 3G and Buffett. All that combined will become the Kraft Heinz company, a publicly traded company with an enterprise value of about $100 billion, the theoretical value in a takeover, Matt. What does each side uh, get in this deal? I, I know that Kraft shareholders are getting, what, 49% of the company? Yes, we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, but yes, B Buffett and 3G get a controlling 51% stake. Kraft shareholders get 49%. They get one share of the combined company for every existing Kraft share they own, plus a special dividend of sixteen fifty a share. That is funded by that $10 billion kicked in from Buffett and 3G. So yes, while they get a minority stake, they get the premium that sixteen fifty cash payment, plus they get to retain their dividend, plus they get to share in the synergies, which is about one and a half billion dollars annually by 2017. And maybe this Absolutely. one is, you can't quantify it, the benefit of the company being owned by what many people would argue would be the two best investors of the world, 3G Capital and Warren Buffett. Uh, and Scar, I know you've been talking to people on the street today. What are they saying about the deal? Yeah, Ed Hammond of our M&A team had called it complex. I spoke with Sachin Shah, the merger arb strategist at Albert Freed and Company. He said this is not M&A 101. This is advanced mergers because typically when you've got a PE firm involved, it's usually to take a company private, cut costs, and then add debt, and then eventually IPO the business. What you have here instead is Buffett and 3G effectively taking Heinz public by reversing Kraft into Heinz, which is a private company who, that will then use the deal to go public and control the new company, which is why uh, it, it's interesting that the company is called Kraft Heinz. Maybe it's an appeasement to management. I'm going to say Kraft wow. Heinz is a bid to appease the consumer, right? Because uh, you don't care if you buy Kraft Heinz ketchup, but you don't want to buy Heinz Kraft macaroni and cheese. Kraft is the more important. I don't know. I don't. I don't think about that necessarily. I, I suppose that's. Uh, is Heinz ketchup more attractive to the consumer? Well, okay, it's Kraft only it's, it's only something you have on the side, whereas Kraft is like a main course. 
it's the more important, I would say, name, even though Heinz is going to run the company, mm -hmm. Heinz is going to buy the company, eventually they'll probably shut down Kraft headquarters. It's clearly it to Heinz buying Kraft, even though we like to throw around the horrible word <laughs> merger. Scarlett, thanks so well, much. Kraft, Kraft is so attractive that they had to split it up from Mondelez, which was even more attractive with its higher growth rates. So you could argue. So as you can see from those videos, uh, it was it was a pretty complex merger. Some even uh, may be arguing that it was more of an acquisition than a merger, with Warren Buffett playing a leading role. Now, Warren Buffett bought Heinz two years prior to this merger taking place. And at that point, Heinz, Heinz was a public limited company. And what's interesting about this is what they did was they kind of bought it back into a private limited company by the, uh, by the purchase of Kraft. Uh, because Kraft was a private limited company, so what they did was this new, this newly formed company of, of Kraft and Heinz, um, that was a private limited company, and then what they did was they carried out an IPO, an initial public offering, to bring it back into uh, being a PLC. Now, what we'll do in this video is we'll just quickly look at what horizontal integration is, um, what's the whole aim of horizontal integration, what are the benefits attached. All right, so to begin with, Horizontal integration, it occurs when firms merge at the same stage of production and they are, they are in very, very similar, if not identical markets as well. So when we're looking at, obviously, uh, Kraft and, and Heinz, we can see in the background all the different products that they offer and they're all supermarket um, style products. They are all the products that you expect to see in the aisles in a supermarket and they're either, they're either being manufactured by Kraft or by Heinz. So actually putting them together we can see the horizontal factors in terms of it's, they're, they're both manufacturers of food products, which are both sold in supermarkets. Now, in terms of why they want to do it, and you can categorize it into two different ways. First of all, uh, let's have a look at synergy. So synergy is where two firms are better off as one than they were previously on their own. And there's two different categories of synergies that we'll look at. There's revenue generating synergy, and there's also cost saving synergy. But within this slide, what we're going to be looking at is just the revenue generating. So you can already imagine, look at, look at the, um, the different halves of the screen. And we've got Heinz, we've got Kraft. Now let's get rid of that, uh, that border and put them all together. And that is now the company. They own all those different products. So when we're looking at product offerings, uh, you now have the product offerings of both companies. And therefore, you're reaching more markets. You're reaching a higher turnover. Uh, and again, what I mean by more markets is you've got customers, for example, who might not like specific craft products but they do like the Heinz alternative well you haven't got the issue anymore because the customer is buying from the same company and also because of that you're all you're obviously going to increase your market share because you are dominating the market with all these different products and therefore the turnover that you generate will go towards the sales within that market so greater market share creates even greater brand exposure uh, you also now have cross selling to customers of both businesses so therefore your market share within that industry will become more and more dominant. You've got greater locations and greater distributions. So perhaps restaurants or shops had supplier relationships. Maybe certain shops only sold craft. Uh, but now, Heinz don't have to worry because the shop, that, well, that shop or those shops will now sell both of them because they're, they're owned by the same company. That's quite common in terms of, for example, restaurants. If they're selling certain foods, they might have um, an exclusive uh, supplier rights. Um, but again, you kind of that removes that obstacle, that removes that barrier by merging or acquiring that company. Now, in terms of cost saving synergy, now again, it's, it's the whole idea is because they are together as one, they're better off. So, what we're thinking about is why would these two companies, because obviously the merger is going to be expensive, but why together are they able to reduce costs much more effectively than if, for example, it was just Heinz trying to cut their costs or Kraft trying to cut their costs? Now, one of the reasons is uh, because of economies of scale and their ability to achieve economies of scale. Now, just a reminder, economies of scale, and I will show you the diagram soon, is where you're able to not only produce greater output, but at a, 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 I suppose a reduced average unit cost. So there's lots of different ways that you can achieve economies of scale, and you could argue this merger might achieve them all. So, for example, purchasing. They have now got even greater bargaining power than they had before. Heinz was obviously a major company, Kraft was obviously a major company, put them together and you've got like a super power of a business where they can really, really um, enforce their power onto their suppliers trying to get the best deals. But, but also they're, they're going to be now ordering 
more stock from these suppliers as one company rather than as individual uh, individuals. You've also got managerial. So what they can do is they, they've got the ability now to um, kind of select the best managers from both companies. And there's going to be duplicated job roles. So for example, Kraft might have a marketing director. Heinz might have a marketing director. Do you need two marketing directors? Maybe not. So which one do you go for? Well, you go for the most productive. And, and it will lead to redundancies, but we're looking at the benefits of the merger and removing the whole concept of redundancies and the disadvantages and the drawbacks related to that. If we're just looking at the benefits, then what we can say is actually by selecting the most efficient worker, it's going to allow you to be much more productive and achieve managerial economies of scale. Uh, another factor is technical because you've got the ability to adopt one another's capital goods. So um, craft might have recently invested in new machinery, where maybe it's to do with stock, um, maybe stock counts or stock distribution or whatever it might be. Now Heinz has access to it. So obviously it depends on the scenario, but if you're, um, I suppose, combining the specialty of their, either their management or their um, maybe supplier network or possibly capital goods, you're going to be achieving economies of scale. You're also going to be achieving economies of scale if you um, do it based on marketing. So in terms of the ability to benefit from one another's marketing skills to maximize the effectiveness of the marketing channels for exposure. So for example, as I said before, one of them might be very, very specialized in operations, but the other company might be uh, very, very effective and very, very specialized in marketing. Well, they both win because they both benefit from each other's skills. And being able to select the most effective marketing channels or having those marketing skills to, to reach the greatest exposure they can, then that means actually what they're spending on marketing is going to be much more cost efficient. Another benefit, and this is absolutely crucial, and it's called risk bearing economies of scale. And what this relates to is the reduction of risk because you're offering more products. It's one way that I like to think about is don't put all your eggs in one basket. Because if you obviously drop that basket, those eggs, they're gone. But if you spread the risk over lots of different products, then what you can do is you can make sure that if one product fails, it's okay because I've got a whole product portfolio of, of more products to offer. And it reduces the risk because if you only offered one product or one category of products and that fails, then there's a lot of wasted resources that have gone into that. But if you've got all these other products, then there's a greater chance that you can actually stop production of that and then move on to the others. Now, moving slightly away from economies of scale, it also helps to achieve economies of scope. Now, what I mean by economies of scope, and I'm going to delve into this a little bit more um, later in this video, but if you've got, for example, capital goods, you've got machinery producing certain goods, but then you, you I suppose, bring in crafts goods as well. So you've got your Heinz goods, you've got your crafts goods, and they probably will be all being produced by the same capital goods. You will not need different type of, types of machinery for very, very similar products. You'll use the same machinery for all the products, but now you're getting much more use out of those machineries, uh, or those machines, sorry. So it's much more effective and much more cost efficient because once upon a time you were using a machine for 10 different products. Now you're using the machine for 20 different products and therefore you're getting better use out of that machine. Now, when I was talking about economies of scale, this is what I mean. So you've got your long run average costs. Now, when we think about economies of scale and think about all those benefits, a merger or an external growth probably speeds up the ability to achieve economies of scale. And in fact, you've probably got a situation where Heinz and Kraft were achieving economies of scale on their own. But now they're combined, they're going to achieve even greater economies of scale. And what I mean by that, they could be able to produce even greater output at a much more efficient average cost. So what we see by the arrows, the, um, the output's increasing, but the average cost is falling, and they'll be able to achieve that. Now, in terms of economies of scope, as we can see, uh, we've got the cost per enterprise, and we've got the number of enterprises. Now, in this example, what I mean by enterprises is the products that they're offering. So if we've got, for example, um, lots and lots of different products that these two companies are offering, but yet we've got the same cost of machinery, well, actually, we're using that machinery so much more than we were before because of all these number of enterprises and because of all of these products that we're offering. So we're getting much more uh, an efficient use out of this machinery and we're making them even more productive.